What do you see when you imagine the future? When we picture what's to come, we often think of innovations that take us to new heights. Some of them are already here, and every day, thousands more make the jump from our imagination into reality. Nowhere is this more evident than here in Japan. Fourth Industrial Revolution technologies are fundamentally transforming the way we do things. All this is happening so fast, and we must do more than just keep up. These emerging technologies open up boundless possibilities of what our future could look like. Technology is not a simple solution to our problems. It poses questions that we need to answer and guidelines we need to write together. That's why we're all here. A global event hosted by Japan that brings together the world's leading voices across disciplines and geographies. How technology will shape our tomorrow depends on the choices we make today. And that starts now. Hi there, and welcome everyone to a very important panel today on shaping the future of the data economy. And uh, the stats show that by 18 years old, a person is defined by at least 70,000 data points and the data generated about us and harnessed by technology is deeply connected with our lived personhood and how we think about managing the trust and people side and technology and governance side of this new trend of personalization is what we're going to be talking about today and we have such an amazing set of panelists joining me today my name is Kabir I'm the CEO of One Trust and we have a broad set of perspectives that are going to be sharing um, their experience with all of you today both from private sector and public sector as well and so we're joined by Francesca Spatoli Sano uh, the assistant general uh, the assistant secretary general uh, of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs and officer in charge of the Office of Secretary General's Envoy on Technology for the United Nations. Uh, welcome, Francesca. Uh, we're also joined by, by Jen uh, Drew Scott, the Executive Chairman of the Commons Project. Hi, Jen, welcome. Hi, Kabir. And we're also have Juan Sebastian, the Digital Innovation Secretary of Medellin, Colombia. Hi there, Juan. Hi there, thank you very much. And Joanne Stonier, the Chief Data Officer of MasterCard. Hey, Joanne. Hey, come here. And so we have uh, such an interesting dialogue planned for, for everyone today. And before we get into the dialogue portion of the session, I wanted to pose a quick initial framing question to our panelists today. And the question for all of you is, given your respective professional roles, your expertise in data policy, from your perspective, how do we ensure that technology is developed in the interest of people around the world when a lot of the perspectives at the table might be in the interest of the company or the government? And so how do we make sure that people's interests are taken into account? And what are some of the potential best practices that you can share from your respective experience and organizations working with data? Uh, Joanne, maybe you can kick us off today. Sure, I'd be happy to. So at MasterCard, we have our data responsibility principles, which really begin um, with um, the idea that we are always designing our products and solutions with individuals at the center of our design. And so we believe that individuals own their own data, they should control their own data, that they uh, should understand the benefits that they, should, that they should derive from our products and solutions, and that they have the right to privacy and security. And so really, if you think about it, people-centered design of all products and solutions in technology really has to be the cornerstone of any good product that's going to be based in data and technology, especially as you think about the kinds of innovation that we're doing today and the way that we have to design for society going into the future. So while we're a company, yes, that sells products and solutions, most of our products and solutions really are all about individuals and making their lives safe, simple, and smart. Thanks for that, Joanne. Yeah, I love the concept of the data responsibility principles, and I'm assuming that ties back to your company values and, and mission, and it's very consistent throughout the organization. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And it really goes back to how do we want to design our products and solutions, right? Yeah. So we're going to use data in a, an accountable manner. We're going to be transparent about our data practices. We're going to design with integrity. And we're going to innovate in ways that we're, are going to ensure that we're innovating in ways that encourage privacy, that encourage security, and that also really make sure that we're also thinking about um, practices that really make sure that we're also um, navigating social innovation, right? And in this era that we've all just lived through with COVID, right, how do we responsibly navigate data ecosystems so that we can have positive social impact? Yeah, amazing. And I've and a lot of the work I know, Joanne, you've done at, at MasterCard, you've you've published a lot out there, and I've I've always enjoyed following your work. And so thanks for sharing that. Um, well, Sebastian, how about from more of a, a public sector and international perspective, what's uh, your perspective on this question? Since 2018, four cities from Latin America got together and they saw that there's a lack of trust in our government. So we need to make sure that uh, the data are secure and increase trust in public institutions. Governments must make sure to bring public policies that will deliver the services based on trust and security. Digital services, whether they are public or private, must give a clear and precise transparent policy on data, which is audited. Uh, I in charge of auditing the information of the state. And with our strategy in Medellin, we have a platform where citizens gave us their data so that we can support them in terms of food and health during the pandemics. And we wanted to make sure that our citizens could choose how their data could be shared and what for. And this gives us a consolidated vision of information. Medellin, we want to make sure that we have secure and enough management of data, whether they're um, automa automated or not, but we need security and privacy of information for a transparent government. In the future, we want to have an open dialogue on different knowledges, uh, talking with different players, and so that citizens may have a knowledge of the whole territory in a collective way. Yeah, that makes, yeah, a, that lot makes of sense. a lot of sense. And some of the things that jumped out at me were the almost the lack of trust in government you talked about as the starting point for creating these services and the barrier you have to overcome just by default as a nature of, of who you are, I think is a really interesting challenge. And you talked about clear, precise, transparent policies on data, but what really jumped out at me was auditing that those policies and that transparency and then involving multiple stakeholders in that process. Um, did I summarize that right, Juan Sebastian? Perfect. Yes, that was the main challenge during pandemic, generate trust in our citizens so that they would give us their data and so that we could support them in an opportune way thanks to their data. Wonderful. Thanks for that perspective. Um, how about, uh, Jen, from your perspective, can you uh, share your experience on this topic? Thank you, Javier. 80% um, of the data floating around the world is created by individuals. And the uh, majority of this data are really controlled by four companies in the US and two companies in China. So there's a very clear inequality. And that inequality has caused a lot of not only just economic problems, but also um, social societal problem and in, for individual, as we are creating this very important, very valuable resource for a handful of your companies, we actually don't have a lot of options in terms of um, controlling and owning our data. So I think that digital economy 1.0 have this very concentrated uh, data ownership in very handful of your companies in the world is broken. 
So um, obviously in the world, there are a lot of legislations and uh, regulators are very focused on top-down approach. Um, I'm more interested in, uh, in addition to that top-down approach, what is the bottom-up approach? There are two folks. Uh, number one is um, how do we create decentralized technology that truly enable individual and empower individual and put it into people's hands? Secondly is in addition to technology, we all know this is not only just a technology problem, there is a business model problem, there is a governance problem as well. So how do we create this kind of um, governance model that will enable and empower um, a, a service, digital service or digital infrastructure that's built and it's truly focused on uh, serving the people. Uh, we all know the most powerful, most valuable part in a lot of those digital services is really the data. So if you're, uh, profit and incentive is um, corporate incentive is focused on generating profit, then, then it's very hard to practice that value. So at the Commons project, we try to we try to address this both uh, both issues. One is um, uh, we establish nonprofit, so there's no shareholder or venture capital investors holding us, um, pressuring us to sell individuals' data. Number two is you know. This is a horrible global pandemic. We, we are working on building Common Pass, which is um, um, a digital wallet and digital passport for individuals to carry their COVID-related health data. But that data is com completely controlled and owned by individual. So I think it's very important to have a bottom-up um, approach to empower individual truly from the tools, but also what is the incentive of the technology providers um, putting this kind of tools in the market. Thank you, Kabir. Yeah, Jen, really interesting. And the way you talk about the concentration problem of control of data and the societal impacts that have, and, uh, and, and taking a little bit of a leap, Jen, on what you said, knowing that so much of innovation is driven from AI and machine learning today, having those major data sets is a competitive advantage. And so these can create competition problems and antitrust issues and empowering that individual. You talked about uh, what I'll call goal alignment. And there's a maybe a fundamental uh, bias in the business models where if you can layer in nonprofits and more individual empowerment, some really interesting strategies you're working on at the Commons Project. Did I understand that right? Yes, um, I would also add, you mentioned um, uh, competitive, competitive advantage. I will argue that as we have more and more individuals realize how powerful the data we produce, how valuable the data we produce, I think it's a different form of competitive strat uh, advantage when new generation of uh, companies, organizations, building digital service and digital infrastructure, uh, putting privacy and uh, individuals' data ownership in front and center, that will become a new form of um, uh, competitive advantage as well. I, I, I'm a full believer in, in not just privacy and individual control, but trust is, is really the currency. And we're starting to see buying patterns based on values, not just price and quality anymore. And so uh, I'm fully a believer in what you uh, said, and we've seen it in practice, Jen. So fascinating um, work that you're doing. Francesca, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Yes, uh, it's very interesting, uh, this conversation. Uh, we all uh, uh, address the same issues from our different uh, perspective, indeed. And uh, let me say the United Nations Secretary General has issued his roadmap for digital cooperation in June 2020, so less than a year ago. And uh, uh, this uh, presents a number of... Uh, um, challenges and opportunities, of course, that uh, these uh, technologies uh, offer to us today and outlines the Secretary General vision for uh, a more equitable way to address and an inclusive way to address the challenges and opportunities we are talking about. And in particular, it ends up with eight recommendations uh, to advance cooperation in this area. And these include uh, digital inclusion, as I was saying, for those who don't have access or who cannot afford the access or uh, who have uh, other uh, reasons to be marginalized. 
but also focuses on human rights and online trust and security, as we are talking, as well as digital public goods and data protection. Of course, we have seen how important it was during this pandemic to have the right data at the right time, for instance, to protect your health. So how topical is that? And uh, I would say what uh, um, we consider this roadmap or this document as the framework for our action as the UN in uh, uh, this area. And one of the principles is that we want to approach it in a multi-stakeholder way. That is, uh, referring to what Jen was saying, the different actors, the different interests, the different point of view, all have their role to play, all have to be there in this debate so that we come out with something which is uh, more fair, equitable, and a balance of the interest in question. Obviously, there is an economic dimension. The importance of the data economy is uh, for, for growth is uh, obvious. But also the uh, great impact that the data economy and the data uh, technology can have for innovation, for social uh, objectives, for uh, uh, sustainable development is uh, very important. And this is what we focus on, bridging the digital divide, and the gap in, uh, for instance, skill set and this kind of things. For us, it's very important. And uh, as I said, the approach, the method is a multi-stakeholder approach so that everyone has uh, a chance to have their views, their interests and their rights included. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And Francesca, it's wonderful to hear the work and the groundwork that the UN has already done in this area. And it, it sounded like working hard to balance the positives and in innovation, the social um, and sustainability goals and outcomes that can all be used as data, uh, and the need for the timeliness uh, of data at the right time, for example, what we experienced with the pandemic with uh, the human rights aspect. And I think that was a theme we heard in everyone from Jen and Joanne and Juan Sebastian is everyone referred to the human rights and the right. I think, Joanne, you started with the right of privacy and security. And, and, uh, and Jen and Juan Sebastian, you talked about it as really uh, a, a fundamental uh, right, not a uh, privilege or not something that's an afterthought. Um, and it was great to, to see that consistency, Francesca. Uh, Francesca, for the audience, you referenced the document that the UN worked on. Can you just share with the audience where they can find that document if they are interested in their own research? Sure. It's, uh, I will put it in the chat. It's in the UN webpage. It's called uh, the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks for that, Francesca. And the eight principles will all be in there um, for... Absolutely. Uh, anyone to read. Yes. Okay, fantastic. And we are developing now these eight principles with a series of work streams, which are, as I said, open to all those interested. And so there is both the, the membership of the UN, but also grassroots organizations, private companies, academia, everybody is included in, if they so wish to participate in these work streams. Wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so, re really interesting backgrounds and diversity of perspectives, but we saw a lot of consistency in, in the themes and the approaches, which was exciting to, to hear. And so, let's transition into the main dialogue, and I think this is going to be a, a really fun discussion, and I would encourage all of you to jump in when, uh, you know, when you, when you have the right thoughts, and, um, and we'll keep it very free-flowing, and really we'll focus the discussion around four themes. The first people first innovation. What is the role of technology in protecting the integrity of humanity? Uh, not an easy topic. So a lot I'm sure we can, we can talk about there. The second topic, trust. What mechanism can we use to better manage data in our interactions with technology? How do we create that trusted relationship between technology and people? 
The third is responsible technology practices. And in the, in, in the, in the midst of just a, a technology uh, upheaval that impacts uh, hu humanity, how do we fundamentally transform the way the economy and society is organized using data? And then fourth, empowering people, something that you all talked about as well. How do we take into account the individual, empower them, knowing that their data can take very different forms? And so, Thinking about kind of how uh, to approach some of these solutions is really what we'll have a, a discussion around. And I will ask maybe one, Sebastian, for you to kick us off with some of your thoughts here. I would like to start by talking about people first innovation people are at the center of innovation. Nowadays, society uh, sees how technology is everywhere, but this makes the uh, di digital divide greater, and we need to fight against that so that citizens may get the benefits promised by technology and to help a more equitative human development. We need to have intelligent territories with the capacity to improve substantially the standard of life of inhabitants and bring solutions to solve the great challenges and generate public value. Knowledge and uh, the innovative initiatives become an urgent need when we want to build an intelligent society that, that is deliberative and participative and that bets on technology to get the referred res expected results. In the Medellin City Hall, we look for different solutions. One of them is a system based on a artificial intelligence to try and prevent um, teenage pregnancy between ten, for girls between 10 and 21 years old. We want to guarantee a high-speed internet. That's why we have a project of a digital highway to bring high speed on the internet at a very low price to develop innovative project based on the fourth industrial revolution technology. We have an integrated system for monitoring uh, uh, food so that we reach kids well malnutrition and so that we arrive on time and also our city has developed a platform that has on um, during the pandemics that has become a tool to solve everyday challenges with regards to the ethical use of information we have three million Point seven uh, individuals registered well, 450,000 educative educational institutions and the platform uh, combines uh, data, artificial intelligence with an application for a, a poli policy, um, the, for the police uh, certification. And uh, some of our workers go from home to home to check the physical and mental health. And they, we have an a, a, a artificial intelligence data analysis to get resource and see, uh, if, you know, if a kid is not doing so well at school or if there may be an intra-family uh, case of violence. Right. Thanks for that one, Sebastian. And there are a few themes I heard. First, there are really important problems that are being tackled from malnutrition, economic divide, teen pregnancy, you mentioned physical and mental health as well, are all really important problems. And one of the things you talked about was the, the digital divide and uh, access to high speed uh, internet cre broadens accessibility issues and broadens that divide. And so both solving accessibility uh, has to have has to be part of the solution here. But you also talked about um, applicability of AI to do um, things like predicting pregnancy, predicting mental or physical health, predicting uh, childhood development issues. 
Um, and so that, that also leads to some of the trust things you talked about earlier as well and, and auditing. So I, I would be interesting either uh, just on your reaction or anyone else's reaction on what are some of the strategies to in an inherent world where it's governments are not trusted potentially in some situations, how do you continue to do these important critical initiatives and, and develop that trust? Is there some foundational uh, strategy you're thinking about there? Oh, I may jump in. I, please, Francesca, yeah, please. <laughs> Well, we believe uh, that there are a few technical aspects as well uh, as the political, of course, will and, and good actions that can help. Organizations should be transparent in how the data is used and provide clear and easy to use tools for the users so that they understand data retention, data usage, and also be specific about the preferences. On top of these external reviews, and that was mentioned before, of organizations' uh, data practices can instill a lot of confidence. On the government side, of course, the uh, government should make every effort using both the legal and the technical means to ensure the privacy and the security of personal data. And uh, uh, this includes also uh, instituting rigorous protocols for partnerships uh, uh, between government and businesses. Uh, why partnership is important? Uh, let me say, Nowadays, uh, something obvious, but still very important. Data sources vary a lot and multiply by the day. There is no more one source of official data. There are data from everywhere. Some official and some private and more or less uh, easy to ascertain <laughs> the quality and the uh, reliability, not to mention the comparability of the data we have in general. So building partnerships is important because this way we can have public and private organizations and institutions exchange data, work together, promote the publication of the data on each other's data portals, support each other, and improve the, the level of reliability and, uh, and so the trust that you can have in these organizations who collect and work with data. But uh, also because we need to, to govern a little bit this complexity. And so the more common principles we have, uh, I think the better for the user and for those who have an oversight. So you, you need to, to invest in all this. Uh, last thing, of course, uh, trust in data also comes in more general trust in government. And as uh, the, the uh, speaker, Juan Sebastian, before me was saying, if you deliver services in return, I'm sure the citizens and people are more willing to share the data and trust that they will be used for the good and not for other purposes. I totally subscribe to what Juan Sebastian said. Can Wonderful. I and Juan Sebastian, I'll give you a chance to react before I uh, turn it over to Jen and Joanne. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I would like to add that, look, we don't have, if we don't have the, uh, data, if people cannot access the digital services, they cannot access the digital service if they don't, don't have connectivity. So we are starting from the bottom up if, and, and, and the other way around. So we are providing connectivity, high quality connectivity to every single person of the city. We are uh, giving a very big investment on connectivity to the people because there are areas here in Medellin uh, that don't have internet at all because it's expensive because the mobile operators uh, is not affordable for them so we are building an infrastructure which is called neutral infrastructure which is re which is rented to the mobile operator which in turn provides the services to the final user so we provide connectivity with the connectivity. We are going to give uh, this year 100,000 computers uh, to the children of the city. And the goal is to arrive to one computer per child in the city. So we provide connectivity. We provide the mechanisms to access the information mm -hmm. through that connectivity. And we 
collect data from the users uh, through the digital services and we are providing services we are providing for example we are uh, showing every single week a new dashboard of what happened with the problems that are happening in the city you know the uh, food problems uh, you know uh, pregnancy in in the in the in the in the children in the, in the city so we are providing this information so people is trusting the government is providing the data because they know we are using this data too for the benefit of them yeah thanks for that Juan sebastian and i think jen i heard you wanting to jump in with a the thought there yeah, actually, what Mayor Juan Sebastian said was a great segue for what I want to talk about. Uh, we talk about trust. The trust is earned. Trust is not given. And trust is not a destination. Once you're trusted, you are always trusted. Uh, in fact, quite the contrary, trust is actually very fragile. You have to constantly working towards this consistent trust. Think about Google and Facebook. When, when it first came out, it was so celebrated. Um, and look at Facebook today, it's completely different. So I think, you know, one thing um, Mayor Juan Sebastian alluded to, and it's quite relevant to what we do as well. If we think about technology and data become such transformative force for our societies, and yet when we think about technology, most of the time um, are provided by large tech companies and often concentrated by this handful, you know, large tech com companies. Um, and sometimes technology is provided by society or by um, uh, governments. However, um, we live in the you know, world where a nation state and digital state, the boundaries don't neatly fall, you know, overlap with each other or you know, align with each other. Often we're thinking about certain type of digital services uh, or digital infrastructure. Uh, perhaps we need a new type of um, uh, institution to really provide this kind of um, uh, global digital infrastructure as a public good. And um, Kamal's project, the reason in the past few months, less than a year, when we try to um, uh, pivot from providing um, uh, Android version of uh, Apple Health, uh, for Kamal Health, to provide health data interoperability between hundreds of different health uh, providers in the U.S. to pivot to provide common pass, which is provide this um, uh, COVID-related health data interoperability between different countries. And the momentum um, we generated in the past few months has been astonishing. And I think that kind of shows the world actually needs a different kind of institution that view digital infrastructure doesn't belong to any of the large tech and perhaps doesn't belong to any of the government and instead being shared and you know, owned by individuals, regardless of your nationality. So I want to pose this as a kind of um, um, question um, to our audience, and as well as to our panel, that um, if we think about you know, walking, walking down the street, there are restaurants and shops, they're supposed to compete with each other. Maybe it's good to keep them commercial. But if the road also become commercial and each section of the road you walk, um, there are some venture capital in investors or, you know, IPO return, shareholder return requests uh, need um, to maximize the profit, and that would be a very bad result. We probably have arrived at the point to start to think about um, what, are, what, what kind of uh, infrastructure and services that, that should be public and should be yeah. public good. Yeah, I, I really like, Jen, kind of the, the thought provocative uh, question you ask and thinking, again, you, consistent with your opening remarks on thinking about the incentives, the goal alignment, and thinking differently about new institutions and, and the interoperability, I think is fascinating. And Joanne, I know this is something you've spent a lot of time thinking about, and I've read a lot about things you've pioneered in the market around data trustees. I, I, I would love to hear your perspective on what Jen just mentioned. Yeah, no, I think Jen makes a valuable point. I think everybody's made some really interesting points because I do think we're at a really interesting time when you think about the kind of innovation that has come out of COVID, right? And, the, and really the cooperation that it has taken for us to navigate and the amount of data sharing it has taken um, and the amount of trust actually that individuals have placed in governments, in hospitals, in health workers, in scientists, um, for us to come so quickly um, from um, a pandemic to vaccines, 
um, the use of AI, right, um, in finding solutions, um, the types of information that has been shared, the types of vaccine passports that uh, Jen is talking about, um, and how all of that innovation has happened relatively quickly. And yes, there's been trust, but there's also been harm, right? We've, we've watched a really wild ride. I know see Jen's nodding now. Um, and we've watched a pretty wild ride around data and technology. And I do think that we are seeing some type of shift. And in the four questions or four areas that you posed to us, Kabir, I do think that we're going to see some needed change happening for all of the players, whether it's private enterprise, whether it is um, public uh, government agencies, whether it is civil society organizations. I do think that we are all trying to um, understand what are our roles as individuals in trying to design the future with this resource called data and technology? What's the role, what's the responsible role and how do we do it? And I do think that what we're coming to find is that we need more commonality and we need more common platforms. And Kabir, thank you for referring to all the work that we've done, but there's so much more to do, right? So one of the things that um, I've been we've been working on at MasterCard is how do you get um, responsible data practices across an ecosystem. We operate a payments ecosystem. How do we ensure that our payments ecosystem has responsible players? How do you ensure that data is accurate? Juan Sebastian talked about this a little bit. He also talked about how do you make sure that you're inclusive, right? How do you make sure we, we discovered that if you don't have information about all of society, right, as you're making decisions, we see the inequities and we see that amplified in artificial intelligence, right? We see then misinformation. I'm not talking even about uh, data quality here. I'm just talking about missing information when we talk about AI, machine learning, and then the resultant impact of that. So there's a whole bunch of ecosystem pieces that I think we, as a greater society, commercial enterprise, government, civil society, we have to begin to build, right? We have to look at how do we improve data quality? How do we improve information sharing? How do we get to those information sharing standards? And how do we share information without it being personal information? So that individuals actually have a right to say, yes, it's okay for you to share my personal information or no, share some proxy information for us, right? Instead, when right. how do we use synthetic information? How do we use privacy enhancing technologies? How do we do other types of um, methodologies? So I do think that we're coming up with some interesting alternatives, and I do think all of us have a really interesting role to play in that. And I also think we're going to come up with different ways to describe the rights as well as liabilities um, in society for all of this. But I think we're just at the cusp of a very different conversation as we look at all of the, of the connectedness of all of the different parties and players. But I do think it goes back to trust, and I also think it goes back to yeah. do this in a way that's responsible. Yeah, and I and I think, uh, Joanne, one of the themes I picked up on was how you talk about we're really at this inflection point, and and you know, COVID and the pandemic has given us some really specific implementation examples, almost created a forcing function of how interoperability works, how AI at scale, uh, you know, just d data uh, across borders at major scale for good. Um, but there are uh, unintended consequences, I think we, we all see as well. Now, in just a couple minutes, we're going to turn it over to, to Sheila to summarize the discussion for us. But I wanted to give everyone 45 seconds to uh, just share some final remarks that you didn't get a chance to get across. Francesca, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me say, I share what uh, uh, John was saying about uh, the accuracy of data, the inclusiveness, etc. What I would like to say is that there is room, we believe, for and even a demand for international principles in this area, which uh, uh, would underpin how citizen data is utilized, stored, shared, so that you can protect fundamental human rights like privacy. And we have now different laws in different uh, countries. This will multiply once again. And uh, what is missing probably is a core set of principles so that these different existing national laws will respond to the same basic human rights principles and also will uh, offer equal protection to all individuals, wherever they are, wherever they happen to be. 
Thank you. Thanks for that, Francesca. Jen, if you could summarize some maybe 30 seconds. Um, I think, uh, um, as mentioned earlier, go alignment is ex extremely important. We can uh, have the nicest sounding policies, um, the most um, uh, pleasant, you know, inspiring uh, slogans. But end of the day, if you don't have the right business model or right kind of a governance model to uh, govern what you do and um, to shape the tools you actually put into people's hands, None of the slogans or policy is going to be useful. Um, I, um, I've been saying this for probably two, three years now that we're hitting this inflection point from digital economy 1.0 to 2.0. Uh, I would like to highlight that in countries like China and India, both countries from different angles started to have this person-based data management system. One this is through uh, Indian stack and in China is this through digital RMB how to empower individuals to uh, not only just owning their data, but also have a re you know, their economic value of the data being reflected in, 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 in the ecosystem. This kind of bottom-up approach to combining with the right governance uh, structure is the future. One Sebastian. Desde las autoridades públicas debemos generar From bienes. the public authorities, we must generate well-being for our citizens, and we should focus on an integral benefit under the government's ruling. From the government, we've been working hard on having a um, on having laws that it will enable citizens to have a say on their data and its use. So from the Medellin city, we've wanted to offer secure security for citizens' data, and they are able to modify them. And in Medellin, we want to use data to understand citizens and so that we can meet their needs. And in an uh, agile way, but also respecting the principles that are security, safety, health, employment, and education. We want to empower the citizens of Medellin uh, with a software so that we, Medellin becomes an innovation hardware and a hub. And we have invested more than ever in education and also to prevent malnutrition. Go ahead. Um, real quick, um, responsible data innovation is going to require um, all of us across the ecosystem to work together to uh, find the right practices, um, to do it in a way that navigates both um, the opportunity, but also navigate the risk so that um, we can actually continue to share information in a way that helps us innovate the next generation of products and services for all, all um, people around the globe. Thanks for that, Joanne. Uh, and now to wrap us up, I'm very proud to introduce Sheila Warren, who's the deputy head of the center of the fourth industrial revolution for the World Economic Forum. Sheila, over to you. Thanks so much, Kabir, and thank you so much to all of our panelists for this excellent conversation. Uh, one thing I think it's become really clear is that as we move to this inflection point caused in part by the pandemic, we're going to see a continuing equation of the concept of responsible innovation with the concept of empowering individuals and creating more agency in the data ecosystem. We're going to see more understanding that we have to be looking at existing inequities in society and creating policies that are addressing those inequities very deliberately. Because otherwise, we're going to see continuing increase in the, uh, the, the haves and have nots when it comes to access the digital economy. Now, here at the forum on the data policy platform and also on our Global Futures Council, which Joanne co chairs for us, we think a lot about these topics and we look at uh, concepts such as empowered data societies. How do we actually pilot policy that can move towards a more empowered uh, human element and within a data ecosystem? Uh, how do we think about the advent of data intermediaries, whether they're data trusts or whether they're um, uh, different sorts of uh, data marketplaces that can actually provide, again, this more equitable allocation of risk and reward across the data ecosystem? Uh, and how do we really think about uh, different kinds of policies that can come in in a more interconnected global way? We think a lot about the intersections of technology and rather than kind of the silos we tend to disappear into whether those are cultural or geographic or even by a sector we need to start breaking down some of those barriers and silos and start working together and cooperating across these different divides to ensure that the practices that are working in one sector are brought over to other sectors as well 
So with those concluding remarks, I want to thank everyone today for joining us uh, for this session. Stay tuned for other uh, similar panels on uh, throughout the, the course of the summit, whether it's on travel, whether it's in financial services and access, on digital public goods. Uh, we're really looking forward to uh, joining all the rest of you later. And thank you again for your time today.